for, thanks for the invitation. So, uh, I uh, take this opportunity to skip a quite a lot of the history of uh, East India uh, Company because I think the previous speakers and the last sessions uh, it has been covered very well. Except maybe to mention that is the involvement of East India uh, Company in Iraq. Uh, it, it started in the 17th century, and they established. I think Nick um, uh, Robin kindly he mentioned that is they have established a factory in Basra. Uh, and there is one when, uh, at uh, Bushahar, I think, in, in, uh, in Persia then. Uh, and uh, later on, of course, uh, the same extensions of the East India Company became the British Empire. And, of course, they used Kuwait and shoveled that away just before the First World War uh, because of the... Uh, vying between the British empires and the upcoming German United uh, Empire, if you like, uh, the newly united empire uh, in Germany. Uh, that, which is, used to be called uh, the Berlin-Baghdad Railway, uh, the Ottoman Empire was there, and they want to build a railway from Berlin to Baghdad. But really, that railway it goes back all the way to Basra and Kuwait, because Kuwait is the natural deep water of Iraqi uh, you know, territorial waters. I mean, that's bes beside the history. So the British immediately went and got Kuwait out of the way uh, to, to themselves. Um, that's the history of uh, basically, and the East India Company as well provided the British uh, governments with a lot of information about the working of the Ottoman Empire in Iraq, uh, and of course the trade. Um, they have as well established some subsidiaries of the Lynch uh, uh, company, uh, and they made uh, basically two ships travel from Baghdad to Basra uh, via steamships uh, along the Tigris. Uh, of course, they wanted to have, uh, before they started on the Suez Canal, they thought of using the Euphrates as an alternative from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates down to the uh, Persian Gulf and to India. Uh, and that was failed because of the, uh, you know, the seasonal uh, rise and fall of the Euphrates water. Uh, and that's a long history. Some of you maybe came across it. But what really I wanted to uh, emphasize the point is that it's very important to remember that is the East India Company in fact, it is made the empire. It is the empire. I mean, if you look at the map, the, even the flag of East India Company, that's a stripe. And this is the United States of America. Take England's flag out and put the blue and the stars. That's what made really United States and the other empires. That's the, the empire builder. That's East India, uh, East India Company. And of course, um, the other th important thing, East India Company made a, an army. It was a, a ready army for the British government to take it over, to utilize it, and have a big colony, and, and made India colony, and reduce the empire of India into almost rajas. Uh, and that's another point which is we have to remember. So it, is a, it was a private army, nationalized by the British government, made it into an empire. And now what we see in the 21st century, Halliburton and the others, there is a national armies used to invade other countries and attack them, and in fact that starting privatizing them. We have now the situation in Iraq. More contractors, civilian army, than the combined army of occupation. And that is employed directly by the United States. We have one, I think, British company, which is um, Aegis, called, uh, constitute of about 1,000 men. They are getting a contract worth $475 million. That's almost over a half a million dollars each per year. That's a huge amount of money to pay a soldier. There is no, Brit no soldier in British Army or the American Army to that effect. 
even doesn't matter how skilled or how high ranking could get that much, much money. So basically, what, where did this money come from? How could they finance that? We should remember that it's before the invasion of Iraq, in the late 90s, beginning of the 2000, 2001, and there is a crisis in some big companies in the United States, uh, amongst them Enron, which affected um, Kellogg's Brown, which is a subsidiary of Halliburton, uh, the financing of many big companies and big corporations start collapsing. And this is, of course, in a market which is very much depends on trust and fairness between brackets amongst themselves because they're a group of thieves. Uh, that's why I look at the market, really, and, and the big corporations. They are groups of thieves. And if they trust each other, they will be successful and they grow. But of course, the thieves, they always manage to somebody hide something. And when they are discovered, the whole system starts shaking. Uh, so Enron actually did a big thing for us and for the system there. So we have Kellogg's Brown as well was almost collapsing. Halliburton's affected. The invasion of Iraq survived, you know, saved them. How it saved them? There is billions of dollars came to their coffers. And there are billions of contracts on the pipelines. Halliburton doesn't involve in only energy. Halliburton involves in actually the arm trade as well. Uh, Kellogg's as well, they are involved in digging for oil. The, the contractors, they become a very important part of this equation because first, when they get killed or injured, they are not part of the statistics. So they will say, that's how many soldiers been killed or injured. But contractors, they keep them quiet. It's like the numbers of Iraqis, they're not important. Whether it is 100,000 or a million Iraqis died, it is not important. Uh, we have, I'll come back to the point of the private and nationalized armies. In fact, increasingly, even Britain, the even sensitive sort of work done by armies, which is they are responsible you know, towards uh, international laws where they are accountable basically to it, whether it is the Geneva Convention, whether it is the any European human rights, whatever, United Nations laws, whatever, things like that. These guys, of course, the private companies, they are not responsible for that. And no government will be questioning them. Bremer, the ruler of Iraq, before he left office, he made the decree, which is law uh, under the occupation rules, that is the private armies or the mercenaries, if you like, or the contractors, the same names, doesn't matter how they, you look at them, uh, they are immune from Iraqi laws if they do anything wrong. They could kill, maim, thieves, anything. They are immune. There is no law to touch them. So we'll see increasingly between Britain and the United, uh, and, uh, United States, in fact, they are privatizing the, 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 the national armies and their uh, forces, denationalizing, if you like. So we are going back to East India armies instead of, but they are doing it more sophisticatedly. This is a, a free paper in London, I think, I'm not sure it's called City Man, I think. And uh, it was uh, Thursday, 7th of June. And uh, I picked it up from the bus, and it says, go ahead for two billions RIF refueling deal. Now, this is a refueling uh, deal, which is for the airplanes to be refueled in, in midair and a contract worth two billions, that's given to a private company rather than the British Army doing it. So you could see there is big chunks. I mean, this is important operational thing. Cannot be given to private. And it is part of the Army, part of the Royal Air Force. 
And there are, of course, as we said, there is 25,000 British contractors in Iraq, yet there is about 5,500 British troops, which is, you know, uh, it is an you know, anomaly. Uh, you have, even with the surge of Mr. Bush, the Americans' fighting force is 160,000 troops. Now we have 180,000 contractors in Iraq. That's more than combined forces, all of them together in Iraq, by 20,000 nearly. So this is the privatizations of the war. Now, how they pay for it? Mind you, the 180,000, a lot of them are Iraqis. It's like the Indian Army. They do not become beyond a sergeant. Uh, and that's reality. It is, we are back, you know, sort of, I want to reflect on the history of East India and now what's happening. The, this army, or the new, how is it they are paying for it? In many ways, they are paying for it either through the budgets of the CIA or uh, companies which are taking so-called contracts, which is really they are doing nothing, uh, in Iraq. Let's say, for instance, Halliburton got a contract to supply the army with food. So they have an entourage of these guys taking food to them. Uh, people who are supplying it with boots or clothes and anything like that. So these guys, they, they uh, sort of guard uh, depots, they guard uh, oil uh, tanks, and etc. That's part of the, before, part of the army and part of the security forces. So that is being removed from it. Um, we have uh, other important things, is that immediately after the collapse of the Ba'ath regime on the 9th of April in Baghdad, and Saddam was running away from Baghdad, um, the Americans, they gave immediately contracts worth about 1.8 billion to put about four oil wells burning in Basra. And Kellogg's Brown went in there with workers, cheap labor from Filipinos or Indian or whatever, from Kuwait. In fact, subcontracted to Al Kharafi, which is a company in Kuwait. And they went in Basra and they took 1.8 billion dollars for putting the fire in four wells. And immediately they went and occupied one of the ports, oil outlets ports, and they start managing it because they kicked everybody there. So the Iraqi oil uh, workers, on the 20th of April that year, they organized themselves and made it organize a union for themselves. At that time they are not up to now, they are not legal. But they have imposed themselves, and then when they went and faced Kellogg's. They said, you cannot stay here, out. And the government and the, uh, because that's a very important uh, source of energy, Basra oil, is one of the largest reserves of oil in the world, I think, a per square meter, if you like. Uh, it's a huge reserve there. They immediately, the Americans, uh, they have to pull out because the, the, they down tools, basically, for all the production. And this is an industry which is you cannot down tool in it because the price of oil will jump beyond the $100. So immediately they, they back down and they got... Uh, I asked the, recently the president of the Iraqi oil uh, workers, I said, how much it would have cost you to put the fire in these four wells. He said, oh, at, if we are so overcharging, let's say, it would have cost us about 20000 to $30,000. That's 1.8 billions given to Kellogg's Brown. Kellogg's Brown, before the war, it was almost collapsing. Immediately start making profit. Halliburton's made profits, huge profits. It's interesting, 
on the day of the collapse of the regime in Iraq, Iraq has $22 billion at the United Nations account for the Oil for Food Organization. And that year, there is another 20 billion came through the sale of oil. And accumulated, there is other money which is everywhere being frozen by the United Nations. So that money, all of it becomes 44 billion. That money, before Bremer gone, spent without even a receipt. All of it gone cash, printed dollars, in craters, in planes, went from New York to Baghdad. And that, these billions disappeared. There is no receipt for them. And when they asked Bremer what happened to them, he said, well, this is not our money. It is not our tax man money. It is only Iraqi money. And that's it. They left it at that. Now, if we think of it, because we know there are one or two ministers afterwards being accused of taking a lot of money, which they did maybe, but not to the tune of two billions, each minister, or three billions, or one billion, that amount of money, because that will show on them. So what happened really to the money? It's important to know that is, it is not the first time in history the CIA sells drugs in order to finance its dirty work. During Reagan, if you remember the Iran gates and the Contra, uh, those people who are too young to remember, basically they were selling drugs in the streets of New York and uh, other places in, in, in the United States. And the, the, the revenue from that, they buy arms to, to sell for, to, to, to give to the Contras to fight the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. I'm sorry, I, I think I'm overshooting my time. Uh, they dollars per, per barrel. So you could imagine the amount of profit from that reserve. And Iraq, actually, this is the known, it is the third biggest in the world. But really, we know, and I know from the experts of some of the oil uh, friends of mine, they know that because Iraq is, has been... Um, been oil country for a long time, since 27. And the Iraqis, they sent a lot of uh, students to be engineers and geologists. And so they mapped all the country. They know exactly where the oil is. And now they want to impose on us to have this, they call them uh, the uh, production uh, agreements, uh, share, share production agreement. The share production agreement basically uh, it is well known for uh, a risk uh, kind of uh, venture. Sorry, yeah. Just I'll finish this sentence. It's a venture point of uh, companies. They go to a country which is not known to produce oil. Uh, nobody knows whether there is existing oil in this land or not, or this sea. And they say, look, uh, you give us concessions on this land. We explore it. And if there is, we produce it, we share whatever we spend, we share it with you. You take whatever X percent, we take that, you know, that percent. This is for unknown quantity of places. In Iraq, as I said, every single kilometer in the land of Iraq is explored, mapped, and well known, and there is oil. So there is no way of accepting that. Bush... Uh, Rice, Cheney, every day they are phoning everybody to pass that law. Because this is why the whole war gone there. And this is what they want. Because they are losing the war, they want to come out with the oil. But the Iraqis know, the workers there, actually the only hope I have, which is most of us Iraqis, the trade union movement. Trade union movement is standing very solid against occupation, but not by gun by means of where it hurts them, it's their pocket. And we are aware of it. Thank you, I expect some more questions from you, and many thanks.